Hi everyone, this is uh, Range of Science, uh, episode 10. Today our guest is Nick Lane, a professor of evolutionary biochemistry. Uh, we are going to discuss his latest book, Transformers, uh, Chemistry, Deep Chemistry of Life and Death. Uh, this is a book about uh, Krebs cycle, but more generally, this is a book about how dynamical uh, side of biochemistry has been overlooked in uh, recent uh, biomedical research. Uh, concept of uh, information uh, so sort of invaded uh, various fields of science. Uh, in physics, a lot of physicists uh, claim that information is even more fundamental than matter or energy. And in biology, uh, many uh, in biology, we since uh, development of molecular biology, we discuss uh, processes in terms of transcri transcription, translation, proofreading, uh, and so on. Uh, information is obviously impo important, uh, but as Nick uh, claims in his book, uh, dynamical aspect of biochemistry, specifically flux of energy and matter has been overlooked and it is even more important and sheds uh, light on uh, many uh, things in uh, current research. So Nick, uh, let's start with explaining what is the uh, uh, dynamical side of biochemistry. So dynamical side of biochemistry, I mean, I suppose it's it's obvious in insofar as any, any living organism that just died a moment ago uh, has the same information content uh, as, w as when it was still living, but is now plainly dead. Uh, it's a statement of the obvious that we uh, need continuous energy flow uh, to stay alive. Um, but it's, it's, it's overlooked in part because it is so obvious and in part because it seems very simple. The, the, the complexity of genes, the, the, the sheer overwhelming amount of information means that there, you know, it can take up the whole careers of practically everybody in the field to analyze uh, the informational aspects of biology. And I'm coming from a background uh, in bioenergetics, so I've always been interested in, in the energetic side of biology. And I think if you were to take a few steps back and say, what is it that um, makes something alive? Most people would immediately accept that you need to have metabolism, you need to have compartmentalization, you need to have information and so on. These are the kind of standard almost school book uh, uh, I would say definitions of biology, but assumptions of what is a living system. And so for most people, uh, a computer or AI is questionably alive, questionably because it can't reproduce itself necessarily or not yet, but also because it's, uh, it, it doesn't have a metabolism of its own in the way in which we're familiar with it. So you can, you can argue about whether they're alive or not. Uh, but it's very clear in the case of life that, uh, that energy matters. Now, when we think about the origin of life, um, these ideas of information um, effectively, I suppose if there's a standard view in the field, it would be that uh, genes invent metabolism. And those genes can be RNA genes at the very origin of life in an RNA world where you have these little fragments, if you like, of, uh, of code. Um, and they invent metabolism. But there is no clear way in which that happens. There's been no experimental work done that really supports that that works. Um, and whatever we, what, whatever mechanism we think about, we still have to make the building blocks of the genes. We still need to have the nucleotides. And nucleotides are not so straightforward to make. Um, it requires some form of proto-metabolism, whether you want to think of that as prebiotic chemistry, or if you want to think of it as something more like metabolism, but not guided by genes. Um, so whatever it is needs to make these building blocks and those building blocks then need to uh, effectively invent metabolism according to this view. But if metabolism close to life forms spontaneously and you introduce genes into that environment, then we have a very different way of taking off. The, the genes from the very beginning have got an information content in relation to this pre-existing metabolism. So I think it makes much more sense to me at least and, and, and the experimental work over the last five years or so uh, from, from several groups around the world uh, is, is beginning to show that this is at least not unrealistic or unreasonable. Uh, I think this uh, metabolism first theory has re-emerged recently. I have read a book by uh, Antonio Damasio. Uh, 
and uh, he uh, advocates that we are told that uh, metabolism precedes uh, genetics. Uh, so uh, uh, you highlight that Krebs cycle is uh, taught in quite a dry manner. Uh, <laughs> students uh, study all the steps, intermediates and so on, but nobody really understands full extent of uh, its importance. So uh, let's discuss that. What are several uh, aspects I would like to particularly focus on cancer, how it sheds light on pathophysiology of cancer, but also other uh, stuff that has been overlooked in textbook uh, explanations of Krebs cycle. Yes, I mean, I think, again, it's the perspective of the origin of life that, and, and ancient bacteria that throws a new light on cancer. And it's actually, it's not a particularly new light in some respects, but it's uh, a lot of the landscape has changed around it over the last 10 years or so. So what most people are taught about the Krebs cycle is that it's linked to energy generation, that we effectively, we spin the Krebs cycle and we use it to, to pull out uh, from food ultimately, but uh, from, from, from the carboxylic acids in the Krebs cycle, we pull out hydrogen and CO2. The CO2 we expire immediately. The hydrogen is not as hydrogen, it's as NADH in the textbooks, but NADH is basically, um, it, it's a hydride ion, it's two electrons and one proton, there's plenty of protons around. It is effectively 2H, that's what I've been calling it in the book, or just hydrogen. And when we see it as hydrogen, what we're doing in respiration is feeding the hydrogen as electrons and protons are separate into the respiratory chain in the mitochondria. And the current of electrons to oxygen uh, is, is powering the extrusion of protons across the membrane. So we now have a charge uh, on that membrane. Uh, we have both a charge and a, and a pH gradient across the membrane. And this is what chemiosmotic coupling is. We have an energized membrane and that energized membrane is driving ATP synthesis. So this is basically how Anybody who's gone through medical school will know the Krebs cycle. It's about energy generation. It's about stripping the hydrogen out of food and burning it in oxygen to generate the energy in the form of ATP. Now, the reason I'm using, insisting on using the words hydrogen rather than NADH is that there is a reverse Krebs cycle. And I was never taught this uh, when I was doing biochemistry at university. And I, I, I've had I've asked at various conferences uh, of people working on, on, on energetics and metabolism and so on, how many people in this room have heard of the reverse Krebs cycle? Uh, and often very few people have. And, and I've realized, you know, this is very well known in evolutionary biology and people working on microbiology. This goes back to 1966. Actually, it was suggested in, 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 in 1936, I think, or th th no, 38. Um, so the idea has been around for a long time. What is it? It's basically spinning the Krebs cycle backwards. So what you're doing is taking CO2 and hydrogen from the atmosphere and, uh, and the surroundings, and you're using energy to react them together to make organic acids, the carboxylic acids of the Krebs cycle. And if you look at metabolism in that light, the Krebs cycle is central to all of metabolism. Now, you may immediately say as a medically trained person, well, hang on a minute, what about, you know, phosphoenol pyruvate is not part of the Krebs cycle. Pyruvate is not part of the Krebs cycle. Acetyl-CoA is not part of the Krebs cycle. Well, yes, they are. They're part of the reverse Krebs cycle, which is a little bit longer. And so the whole of metabolism as we know it is built into this cycle that happens in ancient bacteria that live in hydrothermal systems and, and uh, terrestrial geothermal ponds and all kinds of places. Um, and they're basically taking gases from the atmosphere and converting it into the central building blocks of metabolism. And from there, uh, pretty much all organisms make amino acids. They make the fatty acids for, for membranes. They're making sugars from phosphoenol pyruvate and so on. They're making nucleotides from sugars and amino acids. Uh, so so the, the Krebs cycle is the core, not only of energy metabolism, but also of biosynthesis. Now, if you think then about cancer cells in that light, um, what do cancer cells want to do? Well, they want to grow. Um, and for a long time, a hundred years now, almost uh, the idea of the Warburg effect, the Warburg effect um, focused on energy and this paradox that a lot of cancer cells, not, but not all of them by any means, but a lot of cancer cells 
uh, seem to prefer to grow by glycolysis, which is to say they're not they're not doing aerobic respiration in the in the normal way. And it, it's it, you know it was denounced quite vigorously. Warburg himself was uh, was was. Um, I think he could wind people up. He was a, a very um, determined and 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 um, I, I don't know what the right word for him is, but uh, c- certainly he, he he tended to be very authoritarian in the way he did science and and and, and upset a lot of people around him. Uh, but he's these ideas have come back over the, the last uh, decade, two decades or so. But they plainly are not quite right. There's there's something wrong with them, and and um, what seems to be the case, it's not really about energy so much as biosynthesis. And if you remember that the Krebs cycle is there not only as spinning for generating energy, but also it's still the source of the precursors for biosynthesis. And we know that the Krebs cycle can go, you know, partially. Even Krebs himself recognised that parts of the Krebs cycle operated in reverse. Um, and, and about 10 years ago, it, it turned out in, in, in studies of cancer that some mutations in Krebs cycle enzymes, which can lead to cancer, uh, force part of the Krebs cycle to go backwards. So it's actually fixing CO2 pretty much in the manner uh, of, of these bacteria. And this has become uh, you know, a, a reasonably well-established um, flux mode. The idea that it's just a cycle, just going that way, rather than things coming in here and out there and in here and out there, it's, you know, this, this, it's more of a roundabout than a, than, than a cycle. Uh, and flux can go in both ways through it. And to understand its contribution to cancer, we need to think about cancer cells need to make more DNA, more RNA, more lipids, more proteins, and so on. And so if you've the, the energy requirements for those things are often less than the carbon requirements, uh, and certainly less than the requirements for reducing equivalents like an ADPH. Oh. Uh, in uh, his recent book, Daniel Dennett's recent book, From Bacteria to Bug, he dis- starts with interesting uh, uh, idea that how uh, could prebiotic cycles, different uh, cycles, transform into biotic cycles. Uh, uh, could you comment maybe on that, how uh, from chemical cycles uh, could uh, th- self-replication and the mm-hmm. DNA replication and the uh, life chemistry so, emerge? Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe cycles is the wrong word. A lot of people are very interested in cycles and autocatalytic cycles because they are capable of doubling themselves. Um, but you can take a step back from that and think about, well, what is growth? Um, I mean, growth is doubling. You make more of yourself. And if the, if the units that are doubling are also capable of separating in some way, so just think of cell division, um, then, then growth is a form of replication, which is to say it's a, it, it, it's a form of cell division. You don't need to have any genes at all um, to, to have a, a scenario where you have effectively protocells that are growing and as they get larger, their surface area to volume ratio shifts and changes, they're more likely to be a dumbbell shape, they're more likely to fall in half. And so now you have two cells where you previously had one, and they're similar to each other in that they both have a bilayer membrane surrounding them. Now, if you think about DNA replication in light of that, it's a very precise form of replication. We now have a code. We have a, we have, we have a linear molecule with a code in letters down it, and we, we specifically copy the order of letters. And so it's a very precise code. Um, but you still have to double it. You still have to double the material. You still need to make one extra piece of DNA that matches this piece of DNA. And I think anybody could accept that early on before we had all the machines and motors and (laughs) molecular machines of of, of biology, that that process would be less accurate than it is now. And so what you're looking at really is is an early process of of, uh, kind of flawed DNA replication where you don't have necessarily very much accuracy. Uh, And this leads very quickly to this idea of an error catastrophe early in life. Um, And it's quite hard to get out of if you're thinking only in terms of information. There's other traps with information because a a standard metabolic pathway 
if you would just imagine it's 10 steps long to go to make to make to make the the the, the letters in dna it's actually more more than 10 steps long so the the, the nucleotides um each step is catalyzed by an enzyme and you start at the beginning and you get to the end. So, so to do that in, in informational terms, you need to come up with a gene which is going to catalyze this specific step in the way. And if it does that, well, what use is it unless you've got all the other nine steps there as well? Uh, but then it's a serious problem in combinatorial chemistry to come up with 10 separate enzymes simultaneously, all of which are going to catalyze this pathway. And actually, you need more than that because just one pathway is not enough. You need the other pathways as well. Um, just just making nucleotides by itself is is not. You need pyrimidines as well as purines, for example. Um, so you you very quickly run into some serious headache problems. Now, if you think the opposite way around, and you realise that most of the core of biochemistry is a series of steps. Um, the, the energy change from one product to the next one is usually not very great. And what that means is uh, a lot of these steps can happen spontaneously. And we know this now from, from work in several laboratories, uh, not, not for pure, well, actually for, for, for pyrimidine synthesis, it's been done, but purine synthesis is, is, my lab is working on it and other labs are working on it. Um, the question is, can they happen spontaneously at low concentrations, low yields? We're not we're not thinking very much. But if you're if you if you're able to detect them, if you put something in at one end, what do you see coming out of the other end, or vice versa? And the answer is well, something. Um, and what that implies is that there is some toing and froing across this whole pathway that that one intermediate turns spontaneously into the next one. That this chemistry is broadly favoured in terms of kinetics and thermodynamics. So then the question is, well, why would you have flux going specifically that way to make nucleotides? And the answer is, well, if you, if you load it with the precursors at this end, then it will tend to flow that way. So what are the precursors that you're loading it with at this end? Well, it's basically hydrogen. You're driving all of metabolism by an environmental disequilibrium. You've got hydrogen and CO2, and those two things want to react together, make the precursors, and will force force you in a particular direction down a pathway which is in itself quite close to equilibrium. The reason it's far from equilibrium is because the environment is far from equilibrium. Um, so, so then it's much easier for a gene to, for example, anything, anything that emerges in that context which speeds up the slowest step, for example, will have an immediate impact on that system as a whole. Um, and, and so it's much, we don't have this combinatorial explosion. We have a kind of a network which is already there at very low levels that genes can amplify. And when genes do that, when they appear into this pre existing metabolic network, I'm thinking of it enclosed within, within protocells, if you like, that are capable of growing and capable of reproducing themselves, basically just deterministic chemistry, um, then, then any, any, gene which is capable of improving that or indeed the opposite making it worse uh, has the potential to be selected and so information kind of creeps in through the back door in a way which is which is um, enhancing a system that already exists um, and, and so it can bootstrap itself up and information emerges that way without there being a requirement for an unknown law of physics that explains quantum mechanics into or entropy in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of information it, that may be the case anyway i'm not i'm not a physicist but there's no need for it at the beginning of biology as some people claim um i always wondered why in uh, neuroscience of consciousness everybody leaves out uh, chemistry or biochemistry mm. Most of the theories discuss uh, it on computational level, what happens to information, but uh, it, uh, biochemistry is uh, left out. And uh, your book, your epilogue of your uh, book was uh, very interesting for me for this reason. Uh, and I would like to dis discuss this issue of how um, mitochondrial uh, mem membrane uh, electromagnetic field in mitochondrial membrane could have to do with uh, subjective experience and uh, uh, how mechanism of how anesthesia could work. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I suppose I, I am a biochemist and, and I, I wrote a, a, a book 10, 12 years ago called Life Ascending and there was a chapter in there on consciousness. And my ambition there was really just to explain what we know about it as one of life's great inventions. Uh, and it was the hardest chapter in that book. Um, and and um, I was left with the feeling that not only do we not know, uh, but we, we don't really have a very good idea at all. Whereas the origin of life, people can squabble about it. We can disagree about many aspects, but the, the ideas themselves are um, rational and reasonable and, 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 and um, don't, don't confound the intelligence in the way that quantum mechanics is almost impossible for the human mind to understand what it really means, what is happening with matter at, at, at the level of, of waves and particles and so on. Um, Consciousness seems to be inexplicable in, 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 in those terms. Now, as a biochemist, my question was, what gives rise to a feeling of anything? I think we, most of us could accept that, uh, that, that artificial intelligence is capable of outstripping the human mind, in principle at least, in terms of its uh, ability to calculate and you know, already you can beat the finest chess players and so on. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be any difficulty in principle with, with coming up with a system which is so complex, uh, a calculating machine, if you like, that it, it's, it's able to figure out, uh, it's able to be more intelligent uh, than, than humans are. Um, and would that really upset people? I think it would worry people if, if they then decide to obliterate humanity or something like that. But most people uh, I think, I, I don't know what most people think, but my, my own sense is that they would not be perceived as being alive or being human-like unless they shared our emotions, unless they were capable of, of love and, and, or hate uh, and, or, or hunger or any, you know, there are all these feelings that we have uh, which are biological. So the idea that consciousness is simply a property of matter and that the sun or a rock is conscious in some way, I find that very unpersuasive. But the idea that it's purely a, a, a kind of concoction of a very sophisticated central nervous system, an emergent property of a central nervous system, I don't find that very persuasive either. It seems to me, if that were the case, then, then AI would become conscious and would have all these feelings, but we, we don't have a language for saying what it is in physical terms. So I narrowed that question down to how does a neuron depolarizing give rise to a feeling of anything? Um, what is a feeling in, in, in biophysical terms? That's the question that needs to be answered, it seems to me. Now, I had no answer for that. And, and, and some years later, um, I met a guy called Luca Turin, and, and he, uh, he was talking about the mechanism of anesthetics, and he has discovered that they um, interfere with the transfer of electrons to oxygen in respiration. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it's directly causal. It could be that, um, that, that, that disrupting respiration disrupts the way that neurons work, and that disrupts consciousness. So there, there can be an extra step in the way. But suddenly it puts respiration and mitochondria into the center of the process in some way. Anesthetics interfere with that only. And by, by interfering with electron transfer, you can put uh, not only humans, but also fruit flies or, or, or even things like protists like paramecium under general anesthesia. So there's something central about the processes of respiration. And that left me wondering, now, why, mitochondria then? Why would part of the system, one little bit of how cells work deep inside neurons, have any effect on consciousness at all? Well, I think the answer there is that they derive from bacteria. Mitochondria were free living bacteria once. And, and so the, the, the electrically charged membrane, which is being charged up and energized with electron transfer, um, and that is the, the, the membrane that separates the inside of the cell to the outside world, the inside of the bacterium to the outside world. And, and this, the, the, the way in which that membrane is energized and charged, um, it 
it, it reflects how well that bacterium is doing in relation to the world. If it doesn't have enough substrate, if it has, if there's too much oxygen, if there's toxins around, whatever it may be, that will, it will feed into any of the biochemical pathways in the cell. But how do you integrate those pathways? What, what is the informational unit that says, how am I doing as a whole cell? Uh, and the answer is, well, it can be integrated by the, the membrane potential the electrical charge on, on, on the membrane and any electrical fields that that generates and which would potentially stretch across the cell uh, and, and, and help to kind of integrate in, I, I imagine it is a kind of oscillating dance of, of, of the molecules inside the cell in the same phase. This is, that's imagination, but the idea that you have a, that, that, that you have effectively electrical fields on this plasma membrane, which, which give you a, a, a real time integrated feedback on your state in the world as a charge and a field, um, it does two things. It, it says that um, this gives the purpose for consciousness. It gives the, 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 the kind of the minimum unit that natural selection could act on. It's a, it's a way of integrating the information, uh, of all the information that you have about how well you're doing in the world. So it's very much about a living thing. It's not about a rock or the sun or anything like that. And, and you can imagine, and again, this is just imagination, but you can imagine that if you've got a, a good charge humming away on your membrane and everything's good, that feels like something. It's simply, you know, if you go near power cables, it might feel like something. Um, and if you start to depolarize your membrane or if you completely pull the plug and depolarize the membrane because you've been infected by a virus, you've just switched off all the fields. Um, why would it not feel like something? Um, now, when we integrate this into a single cell, um, as, as the mitochondria, uh, and we have multiple mitochondria, some people wonder, well, why would all cells not be conscious then in some way? And, and, and perhaps if it's a free living cell, it, it, it can be and would be. And if you look at cells under the microscope and see how they behave, it's with enormous sophistication at the level of cells. And recent work from Michael Levin and others show that electrical fields can control development of flatworms and probably more complex things, that the, the fields are controlling which parts develop into an eye, which parts develop into legs or whatever it may be. Um, and so the central nervous system then becomes very refined uh, as, a, as a refined way of using the currency that already exists, the currency of electrical fields that are controlling development and controlling your state in relation to the world, uh, and, and which are then selected for their performance in a central nervous system and can become enormously, enormously more sophisticated and, and linked with the, all the parallel processing circuitry and everything else and all the information processing. But you just, still what you have is in the end a, a, a kind of how is your state in relation to the world? How am I doing? Am I happy? Am I, am I sad? What, what's, the, what's the situation? So it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view as to what is being selected, what's the unit of, of consciousness, if you like. When I say consciousness, I don't mean self-awareness. I don't mean uh, human consciousness as we know it. I just mean what is a feeling in the simplest possible terms. I'm not saying a bacterium is going to feel in love, but can it feel hungry? Can it feel st starved or, or, or thirst? Um, when it moves over, when it moves over there to escape a toxin, does it feel some discomfort as a result of being in the way of a discomfort? It doesn't mean it's aware that it feels discomfort. It simply feels discomfort, and and this is this is the kind of the key building block that's been missing in the hard problem of consciousness. What is a qualia? These are qualia that I'm talking about, uh, and, and so you can then at least imagine how that can build up to the glory of the human mind. Distinction between uh, phenomenal consciousness, so-called qualia, and self-awareness. Uh, some uh, uh, philosophers and biologists uh, in recent books advocate uh, some sort of naturalized teleology, meaning that if, for example, in the river, uh, water flows just according to the laws of physics, mm -hmm. uh, inside our vessels, uh, blood flows for something. It has an end to provide oxygen to the body. So some sort of naturalized teleology has emerged. Stuart Kaufman, uh, Dennett, and several other uh, authors I have read advocated. Would you say that there is uh, teleology in biological systems? 
Uh, I wouldn't see it as teleology. I don't know exactly what they mean by teleology. It's a bad word for evolutionary biologists because it effectively means evolution has some foresight. It's trying to go somewhere from here, uh, and it never is. Um, but if you look at it afterwards, it looks as if there was <laughs> some foresight. The heart evolves to pump blood around, and I, I'm deliberately using the phrase to pump blood. That's a teleological turn of phrase. The heart has a purpose. Um, uh, and I think if we if we try and uh, strip it of that sense of purpose, then we begin to miss the point. There is no question that the heart is a pump um, and it does that job. Uh, and it evolved to do that job. Um, and that's a teleological statement and is not strictly correct because it didn't evolve with the intention of becoming a heart. It's just simply that if you imagine an early worm, for example, is just basically a tube um, a hollow tube of, 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 of a, a muscle surrounding it. And it's got, a, it's got a hollow things inside. That it's, it's got fluids inside. Those fluids pick up oxygen and it, and it needs to circulate. How do you get this fluid to circulate? Well, you can have a little bit of slightly thicker muscle in this bit of the tube and it can contract a little bit more. And now you've got some movement of fluids going backwards and forwards. It's not evolving to do anything. It's simply that the things that have a slightly thicker muscle in the middle um, will 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 it will tend to operate as a proto heart, uh, and and so these are how things emerge. There's never any real teleology in it. It's simply a, a tube. Some of them are going to be thicker in the middle than others, and and that thickness has a in in the right setting has some some use. Now, where does it all start then? Well, to my mind, it starts where back in hydrothermal vents. Think about breathing again. In respiration, you, 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 you mentioned you know, the, the heart and the circulatory system and the teleology of all of that. What's it doing? What's it, what it's doing is, is, is um, replacing what happened at the beginning with something much more complicated because it's much more difficult to do. What we have is a continuous chemical reaction between food broken down in the Krebs cycle into hydrogen uh, and, and, and oxygen. And that flow of electrons, the current of electrons going effectively from food to oxygen uh, is, is, is driving all the processes of life. And it has to be continuous. If you cut it off, if you inhibit the chain with cyanide, for example, does a very good job of it, then we die immediately. Um, and, and so we need to have a continuous supply of food at one end, the hydrogen at one end coming from the Krebs cycle and the oxygen at the other end. And all the respiratory system and circulatory system and everything else is only about doing that, is only about providing the stuff at one end and the stuff at the other end so you can have a continuous flow going down the middle. Now, where does that come from? How does it start? You need an environment which is going to allow you to have that continuous flow, that continuous reaction going on. Um, so you can't have a static environment where things just diffuse away or never come near each other. What you need to have is an environment which is effectively bringing things together all the time, equivalent to, you might say, a circulatory system. And now, uh, this is why I'm back in hydrothermal vents again. I have a system which is bringing fluids, reactive fluids, constantly in touch with the ocean waters, bringing reactive molecules together. So in effect, I've got something equivalent to the mitochondria. I've got two reactive things which are continually having a flow of electrons from one to the other. Uh, and so it's the earth that is doing it for me. And the teleology implied in biology is really only coming from trying to recapitulate what the earth does for the first of life. When you've left the vents, you've got to do it for yourself and it becomes more and more complex to do it. Wow. One last thing I would like to discuss is uh, from your uh, point of view, what, uh, how would you estimate uh, is life uh, prevalent in the uh, cosmos or is it some low probability event that happens in uh, certain regions of space or only others? Uh, I, I think we need to define life there because um, I, th I personally think that bacteria will be very common. Um, and that complex life, the kind of aliens that we might want to meet will be very rare, or rare at least, certainly less than common. Uh, and the reason I think that is because on Earth, um, all morphologically complex life that we would recognize as, as plants and animals and so on are made of eukaryotic cells. So these are cell, cells with a, a nucleus and the DNA and all the information content is in the nucleus of the cell. 
uh, and, and all eukaryotes, plants, animals, fungi, uh, and things like amoeba and so on, share a common ancestor, which was not so long ago, it was two, two billion years ago, but not four billion years ago when the origin of life was happening. So halfway through the history of life. Um, and that common ancestor was already from, from genetic reconstructions, was already uh, complex cells, population of cells. They already had a nucleus, they already had mitochondria, they had endomembrane systems like the endoplasmic reticulum. They, 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 they basically were recognizable uh, as eukaryotic cell. If we looked at them now under a microscope, we would say, yes, that's a eukaryotic cell. There's, there's, it would have been sexual as well. Um, and so that has arisen once in the history of life on Earth. It will be hard to say it hadn't happened on multiple occasions, maybe thousands or maybe millions of occasions. But if it had, then you'd think that there would be in some pocket somewhere some evidence of a system that hadn't completely fallen extinct and disappeared. Maybe there is, maybe we'll find it, or maybe there isn't. Um, the assumption from an informational base of, of this is that if you search enough sequence space, you will find the answer to greater complexity. So you increase your search space and you'll find the answer somewhere. It's only a matter of time before a living planet comes up with complex life. But if you think that genes are not the only thing in biology, which is, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying genes are not important or information is not important, but it's not the only thing. What happened at the origin of eukaryotes is that bacteria got inside another cell, a larger cell, um, and eventually became the mitochondria, the power packs in cells, if you like, and, and, and they provided at the end of this evolution, presumably at steps along the way, enormously more energy to power the work that cells do. And that work for, for single cells, a lot of it is about protein synthesis and how do you make a large amounts of a large different types of, types of protein. Um, we don't just want the 4,000 genes that bacteria have. We want 20,000 genes and we want exquisite control over their regulation and different proteins and we need to express them at high levels. And that, that costs a lot of energy and that energy is provided by mitochondria which have always retained a genome of their own, which seems to be necessary for them to function as a power pack. And to my mind, that is the key. So it's a change in topology. Bacteria are a single unit. They've got an energy, uh, an energized membrane surrounding them. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the topological structure. They have searched genetic sequence space much better than eukaryotes ever did. They, they, they have almost infinite populations. They've had almost infinite time. They've got large metagenomes, very often 20, 30,000 genes in a metagenome. The E. coli has 4,000 genes inside the cell, but can have a metagenome of 30,000 genes as it can pick up from other uh, E. coli. And yet they never became morphologically complex. You'll never, in my opinion, find a human being or even a flea composed of bacterial cells. They don't have a large enough genome for energetic reasons. Um, and so that says it's, it's topology. It's about getting cells inside other cells. And then it's about how does it work out so that they don't all just die in some kind of conflict and warfare between, between cells living very intimately together. Uh, and, and so it's not only about genes, but, but this, and, and this is not something that happens abruptly and immediately, but it's something which changes the potential of evolution. We're almost back to teleology. It's not that eukaryotes want to become more complex. It's just that once you have this change in topology, they can become more complex. Suddenly the gates are open and naturally evolution can take them in that direction. Uh, and so humans and complex aliens and so on are possible. So then the question is, well, is this, is this a trivial thing about life on Earth that we just happen to have uh, energized membranes and, and, and life somewhere else that wouldn't need energized membranes, works in a different way, and then can come up with complexity independently? And I, I don't think that it would be so easy. I think there's good reasons why life here is made from carbon, for example, rather than silicon is very good at its job. It's very good at forming complex molecules. And it's very abundant. It's one of the most abundant atom elements in the universe. Water is very abundant in the universe. Um, to make organic molecules from, from carbon, from CO2, generally the most abundant form, you need hydrogen. Hydrogen comes from these vents as a result of effectively rock water interactions. Any, you know, olivine, the mineral olivine, which is the most abundant mineral in the mantle of the earth, is also abundant even in interstellar space. Um, it reacts with water to generate hydrogen. 
So all the parts are there. And what this means to me is that life elsewhere is likely to look a little bit like life on Earth and have the same constraints operating on it. I would say it's going to be cellular, it's going to be carbon-based, it's going to have energized membranes, it's going to be uh, growing from CO2, uh, and, and hydrogen is going to need to function in a broadly similar way. And so it's going to face the same constraints that life did here, which means complex life is not just going to happen just because we searched information space. It needs more than that.